Hey everyone, this is Jackie. Just a quick note before we get started. If you listened to our episode last week, you're probably expecting this episode to be with Aspen Nelson, one of Onyx's writers and producers, discussing the film Jennifer's Body. We unfortunately had some technical issues with our recording for that episode, so we will not be releasing it just yet, but we are working on it. For now, enjoy this episode where Chelsea and I will be talking about The Invitation, another film directed by Karin Kusama. Now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Film Spill, a movie night podcast. I'm Jackie. And I'm Chelsea. And Film Spill, if you don't already know, is a podcast that we do every week. It comes out every Thursday and we talk about a movie by a female filmmaker every week. We discuss women in entertainment in general and we also play slumber party type games because we want it to feel like a movie night, you know, that you'd have with your friends. Today we'll be talking about Karin Kusama's thriller, The Invitation from 2015. But first, it's time to look into celebrity couples compatibility. Yeah. So we thought it might be fun to find some relatively new celebrity couples, you know, people who got together this year and kind of see based on their zodiac signs how we think they might be as a couple whether it's a good match or not so we'll kind of give our take and then we'll put it into their both their signs into a uh, compatibility calculator so this is astrology daily in case any of you want to play along at home okay well i like this all right do you want to go with the first one that you picked out sure yeah so our first couple is JLo and Ben Affleck. And they are actually both Leos, interestingly enough, which makes a lot of sense. I, mean, I don't know a lot about astrology, but you know, these are two lions of the industry. So it makes sense. And they actually used to be together back in the early 2000s and they even got engaged. And then recently after Um, J-Lo split from A-Rod, Ben Affleck was seen visiting her at her house in April of this year. And later it was confirmed that Ben and J-Lo are back together. Which is crazy to me because she got back with him quick. I don't think she was fully divorced from A-Rod. She was like, you know what, I'm not even going to wait. Let me just get back with Ben. I'm already used to him. Let me just go back to my old fling. (laughs) But believe it or not, A-Rod is also a Leo. So maybe she's into Leos. There's a type there. Yeah. Okay. Are Leo and Leo compatible? Leo and Leo Zodiac compatibility is either brilliant or a disaster. So that makes sense because she's divorced now. I think she's gotten divorced like three times already. At least twice. It was her and Mark, Mark Anthony and her and A-Rod. And then I think her and Ben Affleck were just engaged. And they okay. called it off like right before the wedding, basically. Oh, wow. It says, I, mean, hey. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, hey. An instant attraction is likely as each recognizes so much of themselves in the other. It's like looking into a mirror, something Leos always enjoy. This can be one of the most playful combinations in the Zodiac. Oh, Leo and Leo ideal date. This is interesting. When two Leos want to be the center of attention, the only solution is a place where they can take turns doing so. A karaoke bar is a great option. And that makes sense because they're both performers. They're both always center stage. So maybe they can relate to each other in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that Leo's like, attention they like to be the center of attention i don't know how true that is about all leos yeah i mean it's kind of my thing with astrology like as interesting as it is it's kind of also like take it with a grain of salt you know because i feel like i could read anybody's horoscope and be like oh yeah like i relate to that 
even if it's for someone who's not my sign. Um, oh, yeah. So I was snooping and I found Katy Perry and Orlando Bloom. So Scorpio and a Capricorn. So they have broke up in the past and they got back together. Now they have a baby together. And apparently they do have a strong um, compatibility. They're soulful lovers. Once they prove to each other that they're worthy, there's nothing holding them back. Mm, interesting so this is more of a like not a recent couple but a a popular celebrity couple yeah they definitely have a strong relationship going on seems like they have like a very high sexual like attraction to each other I mean makes sense they're both very attractive (laughs) (laughs) yeah so Scorpio and Capricorn I'm going on the compatibility calculator The stars are calculating. Okay. (laughs) So Scorpio and Capricorn astrological matches create a powerful, if not overwhelming combination that can be one of the best pairs in the Zodiac. So their strengths is that Capricorn can act as the voice of reason for Scorpio, (laughs) helping them to gain perspective when things go wrong. They share high standards and are at ease with physical pleasure, able to give themselves completely to the moment. Hmm, I'm telling you, they have a sexual drive. Mm -hmm. Their ideal date is that a Scorpio is often at their best at night and Capricorn likes activities that offer good value with a nod towards tradition. So a night at a museum that offers sleepovers could be fun for both. Why would a night at a museum (laughs) offer a sleepover? Please tell me. That sounds like something you do with like a little kid, which maybe is fitting because they do have a kid together now. Yeah, they could do that together. Yeah, so one of the couples that I was interested in hearing about is John Mulaney and Olivia Munn. So John Mulaney is a Virgo, which surprises no one. Um, And Olivia Munn is a Cancer. So John Mulaney recently split up with his wife of, I think, six years this May uh, after he got out of rehab. And then quickly thereafter, there are rumors that he was dating Olivia Munn. And now that's confirmed. And I saw a really cute picture of them, like, eating burgers together. It just seemed like a nice, nice pairing. And I hope that they're happy. Do you have thoughts? (laughs) I mean, I don't really follow these people all like that. Like, um... I don't really know his backstory of getting out of rehab. So I'm happy that, you know, he's found someone who he can like help him through whatever struggles he's dealing with afterward. Cause they seem like they're a good parent. Like she would be that like person to help him go through this type of stuff. Cause I know like getting out of rehab isn't something easy. It's something that you're going to be dealing with. Um, Cause he's recovering from something, right? I don't know if you know. I think he was, Definitely addicted to alcohol and possibly also cocaine. Mm. Um, so like that's some real shit. But yeah, I you know I really love John Mulaney, so I hope you know want the best for him. Aww. Well, yeah. I mean, I wish the best for anyone who's you know struggling with addiction. That's something that's not easy to go through, and it's something that you need a strong support system to help you through. So what the astrology daily calculator says it says are virgo and cancer compatible although there are possibilities at first meeting cancer and virgo could simply get on each other's nerves both are sensitive and natural warriors so they might act aloof each might think that the other isn't really interested in a relationship it takes time for them to get to know each other and trust each other but yes if they make the effort cancer and virgo can make a good team Hopefully they're putting in the effort. Um, exactly. And then the ideal date would be one where they're both pampered. A high-end spa would be ideal. Mm. That's ideal for me. <laughs> couples oh. massage. Oh, I would love another couples massage. The next couple that I chose is Amila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher. A Leo and Aquarius. I know that for a fact because I'm an Aquarius that Leo's and Aquariuses are supposed to be very compatible and be really good friends and just get along really well. So that makes sense that they were friends for so long before they got together. And they worked on that 70s show together. 
now they have two kids. It's like match made in heaven. Yeah, they've been together for quite some time and they have quite the history. So I'm interested to know. It seems on the surface, you know, like things are good, but who knows? Let me go to the compatibility calculator. Okay. All right, so let's see. Um, a Leo, a lion, and an Aquarius. Okay, this says, are Leo and Aquarius compatible? Well, I already kind of answered that, but. <laughs> Despite how it might appear on the surface, this attraction of opposites can result in a magnetic combination. It's likely to begin with the simple flirtation. Leo's warmth combination with Aquarius optimism makes them an extremely attractive couple. Both like to look good and are ahead of trends. However, Leo is focused on the self, while Aquarius is more concerned with humanity as a whole. Freedom love and Aquarius can make devoted Leo feel insecure. Ooh. The best date for Leo and Aquarius is one where they can both express their playfulness. A game of miniature golf is a great option. <gasps> I love mini golf. That's fun. Another couple that I actually just learned about, I had no idea they were together, is Olivia Wilde and Harry Styles, which I never would have guessed. But apparently they have been together since at least January of this year. Um, and recently they went on a romantic Italian getaway together, which sign me up. Yes, please. <laughs> Harry Styles is an Aquarius. Oh, wow. He's an Aquarius? Yeah. Harry Styles is an Aquarius and Olivia Wilde is a Pisces. So this says when an Aquarius and Pisces astrological match gets together, friendship is easily established, but for anything more to develop, they will have to make compromises. However, if they make the right compromises, they will find they have a friend and lover rolled into one. Well, that's interesting. So, I mean, they could clash, but they could also get along. Yeah, it sounds like they are definitely going to be friends, but, like, it might take a lot for them to be in a committed relationship together. That's probably why it took them so long to come out with it, because it just came out that they were together. And they've been apparently together since January. Yeah, but the ideal date for them, it says Aquarius likes the unexpected, while well, Pisces wants to feed their imagination. So a poetry reading could make the ideal date. Never thought about that. Yeah. Going on a poetry date. Yeah, I was like, is it like slam poetry? Like they're going to like watch a performance or is it like they're going to read poetry to each other? Because I feel like that'd be super awkward. I could not do that. Let's just read our poetry together. <laughs> I can't even write poetry. I can barely write a haiku. <laughs> <laughs> But let's get started on talking about The Invitation by Karin Fusama. Yes, I like the little Karin. I think it's just Karin. <laughs> just to get it right. But before we get into the details, we will mention that there are spoilers for the movie up top and that it is available to rent on YouTube and Prime Video. Content warning, this discussion will have mentions of violence poisoning, self-harm, grief, and cult stuff. There's a lot of stuff in this movie, so totally understand if this is not your week to listen or watch the movie. We'll be back next week with something a little bit different. So what are your initial thoughts about it? I really enjoyed it. I think, um, you know, it's a pretty by-the-book thriller, and it really delivers, you know, you expect twists and turns and interesting character dynamics and I thought too like at least for me personally thematically it really resonated with me because like I'm an anxious person I've lost people who I was very close to and so it just kind of clicked for me I think yeah, they definitely delivered the dynamic of him being paranoid and they had great shots and sound effects to make it really feel what he was feeling in the moment, especially when the flashbacks were brought into place um, to kind of retell the story of what had happened and kind of explain that. I think where I was disappointed was that they didn't fully explain the death of the son. And that's what made me angry because I wanted to know. 
It's like, all right, this is something traumatic that happened. Let me know how it happened. No, yeah, that that part, that was one of my questions that I had at the end of the film. And I was sort of wondering why they didn't fully like show that. Maybe they wanted it to be kind of vague. I mean, you get the sense that his son was, it was his birthday party. And then he was playing with another kid. And one of the other kids hit him with a baseball bat or something on on accident while um, the main character, Will, and his then wife, Eden, weren't really paying attention. And so he has this guilt around that. But we don't know exactly like how he died or, you know, what the situation was that led to it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. The plot summary is while attending a dinner party at his former house, a man, Logan Marshall Green, starts to believe that his ex-wife, Tammy Blatchard, and her new husband, Michael Huseman, have sinister plans for the guest. And that is quoted from Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, that sums it up pretty well. Um, The main character is Will, and he goes with his girlfriend, Kira, to this dinner party. They get an invitation, the invitation, from... um, his ex-wife whose name is Eden and her new husband who's named David and they haven't seen them for two years so they're kind of like weirded out by a while of a sudden they're inviting them to this dinner party and then this you know fancy little invitation. things start to yeah they get like it looks like a wedding invitation or something like something very official which is their first sign that like this is a little odd and then things just kind of start to unravel from there. I think the beginning was unnecessary. And I don't know if it's like, again, to explain the protagonist's mental health. But the fact that they run into a coyote, he kills the coyote, Mm -hmm. and then they go along to the party. Like they bring it up in the conversation. Yeah, but it still doesn't play a role or a part in the movie whatsoever. So I don't know if that was just for like a jump just to like add something in there. I don't know what it was, but I just didn't feel like, I personally just didn't feel like that portion of that movie was necessary. I think that using that time for something else in the movie, Mm. because the beginning was really slow. Like it took them time to even have dinner. Like I felt like I was at that party for a hot minute and (laughs) then they finally got to dinner. (laughs) Like I'm hungry. (laughs) Yeah, and the dinner scene was pretty, like, well, it was really well shot. I really liked it because it's going back to his mental, like, state. They're chowing. You hear the chowing. It's <laughs> doing close-ups of it. So you really feel the intensity of it. The whole scene where they finally get into it, right, where their true colors finally show. They're, they're obviously there for a reason, and it's not a good reason. I feel like that whole scene could have been longer, like their whole trying to escape faith or everything. I feel like they killed off the bad guy so quickly. And then there was three remaining, but it was weird to see who was remaining. Mm. So it was like, why did they specifically pick only one of the guys, like the gay couples? Why did they specifically pick only him? Why did the Asians get killed off? And that seedy girl, she was crazy. So she needed to go. (laughs) <laughs> she, had um, <laughs> she, she had it coming and what's another thing that bothers me <laughs> that you didn't know what happened to Claire like obviously you know that probably something bad happened because he is crazy but you still don't know her faith like that extra time could have been used to like do another like plot twist there wasn't enough plot mm-hmm. twist I wanted more to happen I wanted more mm-hmm. twist in mm-hmm Interesting. Yeah, I um the Claire thing was I was kind of like, okay, so is she still alive? Like, was she did she actually make it out because she left early enough? Yeah, that would have been good to have a little wrap up of that. But going back to the coyote scene, I thought it was really interesting and kind of like set the tone for the movie was sort of what I guessed as to what the filmmakers were trying to do because it's like they're having this pretty much like everyday conversation as they're heading up to the party and it gives us a little bit of backstory a little bit of exposition about you know who they're going to see and why basically and then um 
all of a sudden we get this crash with the coyote, which I always hate to see an animal get killed in a film, but I think it does show like kind of how an everyday situation can turn into a very violent one um, very quickly, very unexpectedly. And then the fact that Will actually gets out and like kind of mercy kills the coyote is interesting because it also shows he has this capacity for violence and for killing if he needs to, which we end up seeing at the end of the film. So I don't know. I thought it I thought it was an interesting choice. I don't know if I would have written it in, but I understood why they did it, I think. Yeah, I think you gave good reasoning as to why they did it. But maybe it did drag on too long or that that can be a criticism for sure. Because it is like an hour and 40 minutes. And I don't necessarily know if it had to be quite that long. Well, I thought that there was something more that was going to happen because of all these clues. I thought that they were going to turn out to be even crazier. The craziest thing that they did was pull out a gun and start shooting. You know, I thought it was going to be some like evil stuff. And the whole cult stuff didn't make sense to me either. Because at the end, we see that all the, there's multiple lights lit up, that they're in a neighborhood where other people are practicing this at the same day as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So did all of these people go to Mexico at the same time and get this magical hearing from this guy? Like, we just know that they met this guy in Mexico who's been preaching that if you're if you kill yourself, you're going to be relieved from all of this sadness that you had from the, um, your loved ones who's passed away. But isn't that just suicide? Like it didn't. It's like promoting suicide then. I don't know. I just didn't really get the cult thing. Um, I know I didn't get the reasoning for it. Uh, I think it could have been done differently. Like the whole them getting into this cult what a situation. I like the idea. I like the concept. I just don't think that it was written in a way that makes sense. Especially with the yeah. ending like that. Yeah, I think we're supposed to get the impression that like, this is a kind of a new agey thing that a lot of people or somehow like have found like yes there's like this place in Mexico where you can go but you know lots of people have sort of bought into the invitation I guess but um I do think it could have been like the reason why they had to kill everyone else at the dinner party could have been better explained like I wouldn't have wanted it to be just like stated out in the open but I wanted a little bit more information as to like their motive behind it because I like this idea that there's this cult that you're trying to basically deny the fact that you have any negative emotions at all, especially connected to like having lost someone you love, um, which is super unhealthy and I think is like reflective of this sort of cultural idea that sometimes people have, especially like in the US that you can just, oh, just move on, you know, you'll be fine, you'll get over it. And it's like, but you actually never get over losing someone who you really loved. Like, that's always going to be sort of a gap there, you know, in your life. And you just kind of have to figure out how to deal with that versus like denying that it's even there. Yeah. And I think and that point came into conclusion when you see... Eden lying there she wants to get taken outside where her son died and she's lying there dying and she tells Will I still miss him so just to go on what mm -hmm. you were saying that grief is always gonna be there no matter what you do it's not something that mm -hmm. goes away it's something that you have to deal with so emotions just can't be turned off like that unless you're a vampire from vampire diaries that you can turn off your emotions <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Like we're, we're human beings. So, mm -hmm. so Karin Kusama, she is a film and TV director. She has been recognized at Con and Sundance in addition to Jennifer's body and the invitation. She is well known for her debut feature, Girl Fright 2000, which is actually one of my favorite films. 
and I do want to end up watching them soon, but we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, it's really good. And Destroyer 2018 starring Nicole Kidman. Ooh. So a little bit of background on the film. Initially, it was announced that Luke Wilson, Zachary Quinto, Topher Grace, and John Galecki would star in the film. But obviously that didn't happen. And we got our cast, which I think they did a really nice job. I don't even know who these actors, Luke Wilson and all of them, would have played in the in the film. I assume Luke Wilson would have been Will, but everybody else, I don't really know who they would have been. And then Karin Kusama says that the film is a metaphor for what the nightmare of anxiety really is, which is the irrational sense that people are trying to hurt you somehow. But in this film, it's actually rational because they are trying to kill all of them. But I really saw the movie before reading about it as like a metaphor for grief and like not denying your true feelings around that. Um, But obviously there is a lot of anxiety in the film, a lot of paranoia, but it turns out that it's justified. And then this film uh, premiered at South by Southwest in 2015 and had a limited theatrical release um, and was also released through video on demand in April 2016. I like how she said it was a metaphor for the nightmare of anxiety, what anxiety is, because that's cool. That's a cool concept to make, try to make a film out of. That constant, like, um, I mean, he kind of was going through like these, these memories. And I don't know what you would consider that. Mm -hmm. He was going through these flashbacks that were triggering things. He was looking at certain um, parts of the house and just having memories. Like, for instance, the living room, he saw his kid playing or when he went to the kid's room, he was laying in bed with him, quote unquote, like laying in bed. Mm -hmm. Or when he was in the kitchen, he had that flashback of like Eden trying to like cut herself Mm -hmm. I like those flashbacks that were included because it got to bring out more of what he was going through I think it was needed to create more Mm -hmm. of a dynamic in the film I feel like I wish there was more Mm. yeah I think it was a very like minimal use of flashbacks because we were just We were in and we were out. Like we only saw the little snippets that we needed to see to kind of get an understanding of how he was feeling, which is something that like in like screenwriting classes, I've heard people give the note that like, oh, this flashback can be much shorter. You know, like it can just be one shot of something. And that kind of is what it's like when you are remembering something or when you're having sort of like a when you're when you're triggered by something when a memory is triggered by something which i think comes up too a lot if you are struggling with grief and you lost someone in a traumatic way like he did like i don't know if he has ptsd but certainly he's having these memories come back to him and he can't really control them and they're overwhelming him Yeah, like, he thinks he's okay. He thinks he can handle it in the beginning of the film, but you can already tell that there's some tension there that he knows is going to bring up memories. So I don't know if you caught on to this statement, but he, in the very beginning, she says, oh, are you okay to go back to your old house? And he says, it was never my house. That eating came from from money, that her family had Mm -hmm. money. And the first thing that, is said when they finally get to the house or I don't know when exactly but there's some point in the film where the guy what's the guy's name that Eden's with now oh David oh yeah David's like oh it's my house like he claims already Mm -hmm. that it's his house and Mm -hmm. there could have been more emotion behind it but I feel like there wasn't enough Mm. you're like ooh, ouch Mm kind of like why why do you think it's your house when I didn't even think it's my house like it's not your house Yeah, I think there is this tension between Will and David throughout and it kind of builds, but maybe it doesn't get to where you'd want it to go or something. But yeah, I think it's interesting because obviously he doesn't want to be with Eden anymore, but there is some like lingering kind of sexual tension between him and Eden. And then 
there's also this sort of indication that like David has taken his place and like is doing a better job than he did, I think. And so there's like a, a lot of like discomfort there. Oh yeah, but he knows it's like fake though. He knows that mm-hmm. she can't just be happy. Right. Like, how are you this happy after our son passed away or whatever? But like I said, you don't know how, what happened. You know he passes away, but you don't know from what, what was so traumatic. What, does he blame himself for it? What is, like, what's his personal feelings about it? What, what's her personal feelings about it? That she just forgot all about it until like the very end where she admits that she still thinks about him. Yeah, he gets really mad at Eden because he thinks that she hasn't, like, mourned enough for their son, basically. Like, that he's like, you're you're erasing him. Which I think um, is his personal problem as well, because mm-hmm. you can't base your grief on someone else's grief. And I think that's why there's a yeah. lot of problems between people who are grieving, because people grieve differently. Someone mm-hmm. might grieve may get over it sooner and others just might keep dwelling on it it seems like it obviously still affects him to the point where he thinks that she should be grieving more with him or he she Mm -hmm. should still be on the same page as him right yeah and like I guess she moved on in kind of an unhealthy way that like led her to this cult but it is true that like people have their different ways that they process things and At one point, she's like, you can't judge us for, you know, figuring out a way to deal with what we what we went through. And he agrees, you know, but then it ends up in this mass killing. So it's like, clearly, that's not a healthy way to uh, go about it, just pushing things down and acting like they don't exist, you know? Yeah, exactly. So the lighting, I did like it. They were in a dim area. Obviously, they were in the house in what Los Angeles area, Mm -hmm. which also didn't make sense that they didn't have service. They're in LA. They (laughs) don't have cell service. Okay. Maybe that's true. I mean, I have been in a part of LA that doesn't have as much cell service. Like when you're higher up in the mountains, um, that could be it. Yeah, I just think it prob- might have been, like, intentional. They talk about how, um, oh, we came back from Mexico and we didn't have time to set it up again, whatever. But, like, I think they didn't want them to be able to call anyone because they had this plan. And so, like, if the cops showed up, that would be the end of their end of their game plan, you know? But then Will goes out and he's like, oh, but there is self-service out here. Like, he knew how to get cell service. Mm-hmm. Like, in a little part of their yard, very distant. Yeah, I'm like, okay, but if something's really going on, wouldn't you have called the cops already? Or, like, I don't know. But then <laughs> nothing really happened quite then yet. I don't know, but if he could have easily went outside, couldn't they have just ran outdoors somewhere to, like, jump the gate or something? I don't know. I just feel yeah. like it wasn't really <laughs> set up. For them to not really yeah. get out of the house. I mean, I think Will, part of it too, is him kind of questioning himself. Like, am I overreacting? Like, do I, you know, and we see that with the whole Choi thing. Where like, mm-hmm. he thinks, oh, because he gets this voicemail when he eventually does get service. He thinks, oh my god, Choi showed up well before anybody else. And he was here. And then now he's gone and they're acting like they never saw him and he's like the what the fuck is up a couple minutes later Choi walks in the door and is like oh i'm so sorry i had to go back to work whatever and like i totally understand this as somebody who struggles with anxiety like sometimes you don't know if your feelings are like whether they match the situation or not Right? Like, am I overreacting? Am I too worried and too hyper focused on this? Or should I actually be worried about this and and letting other people know? Mm hmm. Well, yeah, because he thought that he was going to prove something, but he didn't bluntly just out say it. 
um, right away. He really kept just going with, no, this is, you know, there's something wrong here. He didn't even bring up the Troy thing right as soon as he knew. He like kept it to mm-hmm. himself. So that was like written in, I guess, purposely. They did things differently. Like some things that I expected to happen didn't, which was something that I liked as well. Like, you know, it caught me by surprise. So something at least caught me by surprise. <laughs> That's a <laughs> nothing. I'm not like criticizing. Like I really like the cinematography, the shots. Um, I just didn't really like the story itself. Like I said, it could have, there could have been more mm-hmm. story. I feel like it was more plot driven than story driven, if that makes sense. Mm. The overall concept of the movie was emphasized more than the actual storyline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like a cool idea. And you know what? It's not Karen's fault. She's the director. So we can't, you know, no fault to her. Yeah, exactly. And I really liked how she directed it. Like, I do like the shots in this film. Um, it's really cool. I really like the mm-hmm. lighting. Like I said before, what they were working with, they had some really great shots, especially the dark, like um, the shot by the pool when it was getting darker, just like scenes that you mm-hmm. couldn't really tell what was going on, but you could. Um, like it was certain things were done on purpose. And I like when it that was done or like to like create more dynamic to the story to create more um, intensity suspension thrill because mm-hmm. you know that's what it was <laughs> yeah a thriller as they say i saw it labeled some places as horror and some places as thriller but i say it's a thriller i think it's definitely a thriller it's not too gory to be a horror mm-hmm. like i'm telling you they just get shot and like, then what David gets like a knife in him and then he dies right away usually they like don't die right away like you know that the evil person keeps on Mm -hmm. like kicking and fighting back (laughs) like I feel like it just happened too soon yeah it all goes crazy at the very end like it's just people are dropping left and right I saw um somebody when uh I was reading about this film call it a dinner party from hell and like that's like apparently a um sort of a genre like a subgenre. but yeah so it's all contained in this one house which helps it feel realistic and kind of like you think oh like this is a crazy sort of exceptional thing that's happening but then at the end when we see all the lanterns and everybody else's yards it's like oh shit it's much bigger than we ever even anticipated and we and we got that reaction from will and kira yeah definitely like a good plot twist perfect thriller ending and but the coyotes howl at the end too which is kind of tying it all yeah together. tying it all together with like the coyote that he ran over but i don't know like i said i wanted a little bit more meat it, it was good though it was <laughs> it wasn't like oh my god i was bored throughout like i kept watching it if i was bored I wouldn't have kept watching it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have watched it a second time. I needed to watch it a second time to really understand it um, and get more things mm-hmm. that I didn't get the first time watching them, like the film. So what did you think about the editing? Similar to Jennifer's body, I noticed quite a bit of slow-mo that kind of emphasized like important moments or built tension. And it also helped us to feel like we were in will's shoes and i think the pacing was really interesting like you talked about it being too slow um which could definitely be argued but i think the way that this film can speed up and then slow right back down is honestly very impressive yeah and then we talked about the flashbacks already but um i think they were well done it wasn't too much you know it didn't feel like we were living in the flashbacks we just saw enough to uh get a sense for what his life used to be like and um they had a really distinct color palette separate from the dinner party so we were always like clear on okay this happened in the past because the dinner party you know, it's warm tones and it's it's dark and shadows, it's nighttime. And the memories were more cool and they kind of remind me of morning. 
Yeah, they was, had like uh, some of them had like a blue tint to it, like very. Um, it was like edited in a certain way where um, it lagged. It was like slow paced too, like those like usual mm-hmm. flashback scenes where it's like slow, kind of like laggy, with, like a cool tone to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of fuzzy too, like the camera was not as focused. Yeah, um, exactly. Only certain parts. There was other scenes that were more focused, like the shower scene where they're getting, I mean, not the shower scene, they're when they're bathing together, that was more clear. True, yeah. I didn't think about that, um, that scene. Yeah, it wasn't the usual flashback that he was getting. So maybe it was like yeah. a different dynamic. It wasn't, so it was a lighter scene, so it wasn't so fuzzy. But the more traumatic mm-hmm. scenes were more fuzzier because it was like it happened so quickly. So maybe it mm-hmm. is like a blur. That's why they did it purposely like that. More symbolic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's kind of almost like had to put this coding over these memories because they're painful. Mm-hmm. Um Potentially. Although it's the scene where he's in his son's room and he lays down, which is such a sweet scene and I almost cried. That scene is also in that kind of fuzzy blue filter, Mm -hmm. which maybe it's just hard for him to like think about a very like tender moment between him and his son because it's painful for him to even remember that he had that relationship because it just you know brings up those feelings of that's gone now yeah and there was a lot of attention to detail put into the actual room itself it looked like he never left so the bed Mm -hmm. even if you look at the pillow it looked like someone slept on it the bed wasn't fixed there was still toys on the ground exactly like he would have left it if he was just there you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he remembered exactly what it used to look like, even though the room now is like an office in their house, which kind of symbolizes too how Eden has moved on or tried to move on from losing their son. And Will has not, he can imagine, he can only see the room as it used to be when his son was there. Yeah. So story-wise, it was you thought it was a good use of foreshadowing yeah just like with the um you know the coyote and then other scenes at the beginning especially between like eden or david and the other guests like i thought we were able to catch on pretty quickly that like this isn't just your average dinner party um but it wasn't super blatant and we were able to kind of see why people would just be kind of like acting like it was just another day I guess yeah they just kept going like they were just like the only person that wasn't feeling it was Claire Mm -hmm. she was like no I'm not with it like this is getting too much I would have said that from the beginning I'm like no this is creepy I need to get out of here but I guess like you know they were there for eating like they were friends with Eden as well as Will. I guess they were Eden and Will's friends. They shared mm-hmm. like similar friends or whatever. Crazy shit. It makes you not want to go over to your friend's house. <laughs> like someone that you trust kind of like backfires mm-hmm. on you and does something crazy that you're not expecting. Like that is it's pretty scary. So to make that into a film. And I think they might have felt obligated to the other guests because they knew that Eden and Will had gone through something really tough and they didn't want to just like dip at the first sign of something kind of odd. Um, And they also haven't seen each other for a couple years. Mm. So, you know, there's some motive for them to stay, but I might have been leaving with Claire, you know. I know. (laughs) I'm out. I would have went to go check up on Claire or would have went outside. That's why... I I wanted to know about Claire and we didn't get to know. I guess I'll never know unless I ask Karin, like, what happened to Claire? True. True. She's like, whatever you want to happen to Claire. Yeah, that would be the answer, (laughs) which is always so frustrating. I know. Whatever you think. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Like, no, I can't. That, that's what I don't want to do as a filmmaker either. Like, I get it. You want your people to tell their own story, to have their own conclusion to it. That's the whole purpose, <laughs> to create this mystery around the story. But just give me a fucking answer. That's all I want. <laughs> I don't yeah, want you to say mystery. You could say this is what I think. Yeah. You know. But you if you think something else, that's valid too, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. Your opinion is always valid. <laughs> so I was impressed by um how well like we sort of get to know all the different characters because there's a shit ton of characters in this movie but they all have unique like voices and even some of them like claire who leaves pretty quickly we already feel like we have a sense of who she is and kind of what role she plays in the friend group um that's really hard i've tried to write scripts before with lots of characters and it is not easy to balance everyone and make sure everybody gets their their time. So that I was impressed by. Do I think Kira could have been a little more interesting? Yeah, but um, I, I liked the characters in general. Yeah, I felt like Kira was more like a friend or tag along than Will's actual girlfriend, especially when Sadie tries to seduce Will. Like, where's Kira? I would have liked some girl on girl action where she's like beating her up or like back off oh. my man. And then that's when the craziness starts. You know, I feel like a lot of those moments could have been where the craziness starts happening. Like mm -hmm. you start seeing Sadie crazy when she starts making those faces. Those like weird ass faces. Like that's, yeah. that's only creepy to an extent. Right. Yeah. She says this thing that was very scary but it didn't really go anywhere where she was like i can make you like me so much and i was like that's scary as hell like he's saying absolutely not i am taken i'm not interested in you all this stuff and then she's just like continuing on and saying kind of like i can make you like me if you don't just made her seem desperate but yeah, the other characters, we haven't talked about them that much, but um, so there's Tommy and Miguel, and they're a couple, and they seem to be close with Will. And Tommy, aside from Will and Kira, is the only other survivor. And then Claire, who we talked about, and then Gina, who is kind of like a party girl. I don't know, she seems fun. Um, and Sadie actually like makes out with her at one point and she's just like, okay, <laughs> which is sort of interesting. Like she's not, she's not mad at all. She's kind of like, that's fine with me. Um, and then Choi, who is her boyfriend, who they talk about throughout and they're like, oh, when's Choi going to get here or whatever, kind of like making fun of him that he's always late to stuff. Will gets the voicemail and, um thinks that Choi has been killed but then he shows up at the very end only to then get killed <laughs> in like the next you know 10-15 minutes gets killed right away I was kind of surprised that Gina was the first one to go but at the same time she was the one who was like the most put out there of all the friends I feel like mm. she had the more um she had like more dialogue she was the one really like the life of the party yeah like you were saying mm -hmm. more like she was about to do cocaine with this so-called sober guy mm -hmm. doesn't do cocaine because this call apparently saved him from doing that but obviously that's a lie like that's already a red flag mm -hmm. there but nothing is said about the red flags already you know Will is the only one catching on, but nothing is, I guess you, you, this is, it's the job. It's like the audience's job to really pay attention to the, to the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he's starting to put the piece together and then eventually he confronts them about it, but it takes a while. So yeah, it's kind of up to you to see what he sees, I guess. Um, I forgot to mention Ben as well. Ben is also there. He's one of their good friends. He's kind of like a class clown type guy, but we don't really know too much else about him. 
And isn't, then um, isn't he the one that Eden slaps? Yes, yeah, he's kind of joking around about something about, oh, she's saying, like, you don't have to be weighed down by all these negative emotions, like, you can just move on from them and um, rid yourself of them. And then Ben makes some kind of joke about that, like, he doesn't believe it, and she slaps him, which is another, like, foreshadowing that we kind of get that says like this is not normal like there's potential for something really fucked up to happen yeah exactly but nothing said i mean Um, things are starting like i said things are starting to add up but sadie's crazy she met eden and david in mexico she's also part of the invitation she's weird she comes out of nowhere she's first seeing when will looks over to the side and she's like undressed half like undressed then she comes out and gets introduced. Pruitt is some other random weirdo who shows up there. He talks, he, he also says that um, they met in Mexico and he has some weird energy. He starts talking about his dead wife and how he forgave himself because the invitation helped him overcome that. And they're watching this weird film about the invitation. They're showing that. And after that, that's when... Claire gets weirded out and she leaves and he says Mm -hmm. that oh I'm parked right behind you are you are you the Prius I'm parked right behind a Prius and that's what makes him go out but you already know that he's sketchy from the beginning both of them Mm -hmm. are really sketchy from the beginning yeah it's like who the fuck are these people like because you kind of get the sense we have this core friend group they've known each other for years they have a lot of history and then all of a sudden there's these two randos who already have weird energy coming in and it's just it's strange and then um Pruitt in his little like speech about his wife he talks about how much he loved her but then he also says that they got into an argument one night and he hit her and she died and it's just like whoa like again the like quick um escalation like going from a very, very chill sort of thing, sweet moment. He's talking about how much he loved his wife. Then, and yeah, by the way, I killed her. Um, But like, he no longer lives with that, the guilt of that, which is like, it feels iffy because it's like, well, like you did kill someone. I, you know, like either you should, you hope that someone would have some kind of remorse. Yeah, and like someone close to you, and the fact that he said he only spent seven years in prison for killing his wife, eh, that seems kind of unrealistic. Mm, yeah, I don't know what the normal charge is, but that does seem a little short. I would want your ass back in prison. <laughs> no way. I wouldn't even get near yeah, someone and that's who's why done that. Yeah, and that's why it's scary when he offers to, like, move his car because we know that he has this history and Will is thinking that too and he's watching through the window. Then David uh, comes and interrupts interrupts him, I guess. Um, Yeah, to like try to get him to not look at what Pruitt is doing. mm -hmm. But you don't know because he does come back. So who knows if he already had the gun in his pocket, he could have shot her, I don't know. Mm Mm-hmm. Could have done something with the car. Do we see the car drive away? I we see we her back up and then she's about to go and then he goes to the car. Okay. He so said, she hasn't left yet. No. So like he goes to the car, right? And then that's it. Then he then um Will gets distracted by David. I don't think he even looks back because then Perit comes in. And he was like, Oh, I tried to apologize for my story that made her feel uncomfortable. So yeah, and then that's that. You don't you don't know what happened to her. So the dialogue, I was really paying attention to what they were saying and the simplicity with it. There wasn't too much like monologues. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of like short, simplistic dialogue, but like you said, it was delivered well. Like it said whatever it needed to say. 
there was there was a purpose to whatever was said and there were certain things like i said were added onto there to create this mystery that you needed to pay attention to what was already said and how the story was progressing and what was happening for whatever reason even though like i said some things weren't clear <laughs> <laughs> i think the dialogue sounded very natural like very believable and i don't think there was a lot of like bald exposition like a lot of somebody just saying i'm going to my ex ex ex-wife's house for dinner like will never actually said that we just kind of got that through context and i think like that is definitely a plus but then we saw some things by the end are still not totally explained and so you kind of get why like it's hard to do everything through sort of a naturalistic dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely keeps you wondering. But like I said, that's like any good movie too that just keeps you wondering like what else or has like a plot twist ending. But I don't know. I feel like sometimes it's done really well that you're like, no, it's supposed to end like that. Mm -hmm. Like Jordan Peele is a really good director that does that type of stuff. Like he does this thriller type vibe and, you know, the dialogue's really well done. Yeah, no, I mean, it it wasn't like the best storyline that I've ever seen in a film, but it definitely, like it did the job. And I think, you know, we were there for Karin Um, We were there for the shots and the directing, the acting, um, the editing, and all of that was was really good. Yeah, exactly. Like, I like the editing. I like the cinematography. I like the choice of what was emphasized in each shot. Um... It was a lot different than what we watched with Pariah and Jennifer's body, um, the framework. You know, I did see similarities with um, Jennifer's body in this. So she obviously has like a certain theme that she does for her movies. I just have to rewatch or watch more of her films to see if that's just consistently her style. You know, maybe Mm -hmm. that's her mark in films. You never know. Everyone has their certain style or something that they really like doing just because it comes out so great. So she probably does things in a certain way for a reason. She's been doing it for so long. So, you know, I what I've learned about filmmaking is that you always test out different ways to make things better or you just use similar things because you liked how it looked in your um, your past projects. Yeah, why mess with perfection, right? So, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to watch. Now that we've seen two um, Karin Kusama films, I had never seen any before this, before Jennifer's Body. Um, definitely want to watch Girl Fight and Destroyer. So maybe those will be future episodes. Although I think we're going to take a little break from her for now and maybe come back in the future. Yeah, definitely come back in the future. Girl Fight is definitely like a woman empowerment type film where you see this girl, I'll give you a little backstory for you. Um, You see this girl getting into like boxing, which is something that's stereotypically like a guy sport, but, um, and it's a Hispanic girl or a girl of color. So, and that's what I liked about this film, speaking of like people of color or whatever, going back to characters, I'm sorry, I'm like going back to the characters really quick. But I liked how there was diverse characters, like with the gay couple, there was a Hispanic guy in it. It wasn't like two white male gay guys. Um, There was an Asian couple. We had um, Kira, who was a black American. We had Will, who was white. Um, Eden was white, but her friends were white as well, like the crazy people. Maybe they're trying to make a statement that, um, you know, I don't know, white people can be crazy sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah I think like a um like I remember my boyfriend talking about how he won't put like a white guy in his movie or in his in his work unless like he's gonna get tortured or like he's gonna be like a villain type oh my thing God. Yeah. because he doesn't he doesn't want to like just have like that he only wants to use a 
white male protagonist if he feels like he couldn't do that otherwise you know like if he feels like it would be uncomfortable for him as a white guy to put like you know a black woman in a situation where she's being tortured like that doesn't seem right do you have any final thoughts about the invitation no i think that everyone should take a look at it it's actually free on youtube i found a free um link to it so if you guys want to watch it for free oh, on for youtube real? yeah it's possible so yes if you want to watch it for free on youtube you can i think it's like the second um the second one that comes down and plus you will be able to notice it says like an hour and 40 minutes on the thing below but try not to let the news out so youtube doesn't take it down (laughs) (laughs) keep it secret keep it on the dl thank you for listening this has been film spill a movie night podcast follow us on instagram at film spill pod and tell a friend about the podcast if you like you can support the podcast at film spill pod on paypal special thanks to onyx films for promoting us You can check out other Onyx films slash projects, including some of our short films at onyx-films.com. And we'll be back next week with an episode on The Farewell by Lulu Wong with Onyx producer, writer, and director Haley Nash. So stay tuned for that. The editing was done by Chelsea. The cover is by me, Jackie. And until then... Don't cry over a spilled film.